Welcome uh, uh, from VOTV and the Fellowship of Servants. Uh, VOTV stands for the voice of the voiceless. Today we, we're going to have a wonderful meeting with our brother Jacob Crash. As you can see my daughter's picture here, VOTV began because of Anaya Gabriella song. Today we, we have with us Jacob Crash from Moriel Ministries. Uh, uh, the Fellowship of Servants is affiliated church with Jacob and we thank our brother uh, on a daily basis and we continuously keep him in prayer for speaking the truth. Now, Jacob's an author as well as obviously being the director of Moriel Ministries where he uh, ministers the gospel throughout the world and also reaches the Jews in Israel by spreading the gospel, which we, which we support. Also, we also know that he's uh, began a new project in India, which VOTV and the Fellowship of Servants also supports. Now, the books that uh, Jacob Crash has author, uh, authored are Shadows of the Beast, which is a fantastic book, uh, Sightful, and uh, Prepares Us for the End Days, Harapazo, which is a book on the rapture, Grain for the Famine, the Final Words of Jesus, and The Dilemma of uh, Laodicea. Now, all these books you can get on Amazon. Uh, I would recommend these books to every brother and sister. And to have Brother Jacob Crash, especially during the period that we're in right now, is a blessing and it's good to know that his health is well. Now, Jacob, this, uh, before we begin, I'm just going to read a scripture from uh, Isaiah chapter 46, which makes people understand and realize that though we're facing all these situations, that we serve a God, the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the father of Israel, the, you know, the God of Israel, the father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, above father himself. And he says in Isaiah chapter 46, verses 5 to 10, it reads, To whom would you liken me? God is speaking. God is saying, To whom would you liken me and make me equal and compare me? that we would be alike. Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh silver on the scale, hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a god. They bow down, indeed they worship it. They lift it up uh, on their shoulders and carry it. They set it in a place and it stands there. It does not move from its place. Though one may cry to it, it cannot answer. It cannot deliver him from his distress. Remember this and be assured. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times things which have not been done. Saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasures. Now, during this time of COVID-19, the records have been there's over 281,000 deaths recorded, even though there are a lot of people and doctors that are saying that a lot of people are making up a lot of these figures, but the recorded deaths on uh, the updates is 281,000. There's 80,000 alone in America, 32,000 alone in the United Kingdom, 31,000 in Italy, and over 226,000 in France and Spain. Now, Trump has gone on record saying that they have evidence that this COVID-19 pandemic began in a laboratory. Now, whether it's uh, in, intentional uh, or mistake, the virology laboratory in Wuhan, Trump is saying that they have evidence that's where the pandemic started. Now, Trump has a doctor called Dr. Fauci. Now, sometime last year or the year before that, Fauci, without government approval, gave $3.7 million to the virology laboratory in Wuhan. What for? For the testing of pandemics on bats. Now, he did that without government approval. Now, what's also interesting during this lockdown is how Bill Gates' name is resounding everywhere. Now, we understand that he's heavily promoting ID 2020 and the vaccination of, he wants to vaccinate all people on planet Earth. We know that Bill Gates is heavily into population control. And we know that Bill Gates and his parents and his grandparents are heavily associated with Planned Parenthood and the deep state. So there's a lot of things that people are talking about and speculating and assuming. And the purpose for this meeting today, we don't serve a God that assumes. 
We serve a God that knows all things. We serve a God that knows the end from the beginning. And those who put their hope in Jesus Christ have that insight. The reason why we have that insight is the illumination of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Now, what's interesting is Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter 21, all these things will come to pass, the beginning of birth pains. And when you see a lot of Bible prophecy teachers, true Bible prophecy teachers, I'm we thank uh, God for Brother Jacob Prashen for what he's teaching during this pandemic. Jesus specifically spoke about make sure that you are not deceived in the end days, deception, apostasy. Now, we studied as the Fellowship of Servants on VOTV a couple of weeks ago the sins of Manasseh and how Josiah brought down the things that Manasseh built up and, and the rest of the kings of Judah. And we knew that they sacrificed their babies to Molech, which is abortion, male prostitution, which, which is like homosexuality in the churches today, idol worship, where we have Hinduism and yoga and trans meditation and all forms of different religions that have come into the church today, the, ne the neglect of God's word and how people are building their own empires instead of the house of God. So there's no fear. And they're kicking out the cross of Jesus Christ and bringing all this nonsense of positivity. So Jesus speaks heavily about deception and that apostasy is right here now. You have the false teachers that go on to say, neglect end time teaching. Whereas Jesus told us to be watchful and be alert, knowing the times that we're living in. So as people are panicking and people are worried and people are anxious, there's only one place where you're going to truly find peace. In the Prince of Peace, which is Jesus Christ himself. Jesus spoke that during this period, You'll hear, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, nation v. nation, which Brother Jacob has done a teaching on, a fantastic teaching, which is ethnos v. ethnos, kingdom against kingdom, famines, earthquakes, and pestilence. Pestilence, pandemics. Now, also, Jesus also said, during this period, the hatred of Christians shall accelerate. Now, what? not only the hatred of Christians, anti-Semitism has increased. You got certain um, people that go around saying that it's the Jews, just like they did during the period of the Nazis, with the, the protocols of Zionism. That the Jews have created the COVID-19, which is a load of rubbish anyway. So the hatred of Christians is accelerating. We know in North North Korea, in Pakistan, in China, we know that Christians are facing persecution. Underground churches are being monitored, and we know that they're being persecuted. But the missing element. From the past fathers that used to speak that are we, you know, are we the generation or are we there yet? Was Israel, and we know in 1948 Israel was established in one day, 1967, they recaptured Jerusalem. And we know last year Trump brought the, uh, the United States Embassy back to Jerusalem and declared Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. So all these things are happening in one given situation, not just that. We know that the book of Ezekiel speaks of a confederacy that will come together, that will come against Israel. For their, uh, and that confederacy is a combination of Russia, Turkey, Iran, Libya, and Sudan. Now what's interesting is, last year they had a conference with Russia, Turkey, and Iran, speaking about how they can come together for power, uh, oil, and other commodities. So. These embryos are all coming together at once. We also see that back in 1974, the Club of Rome was established. That is dividing the world into 10 regional kingdoms. We also know that Western European Union is a confederacy of 10. Also, during the time of the ISIS, um, we know that 10 Arab states came together to say that they will fight against ISIS and they are on friendly terms with Israel. Macron, the, pre uh, the, Prime Minister, the, uh, the President of France, in November 2018, said that we need a coalition of 10 powers of Europe because EU is failing. And we need to make it a real European army. And we need to fight against all forms of pandemics and wars as a 10-nation confederacy. So these are all embryos that are happening all at one, one stage. Also, during the time of Manasseh, the last conference we did with Moriel was back in 2014, which was the Manasseh Project. 
And we spoke about the sins of Manasseh and how God says he will not relent from his judgment. We know since 1980, 1 1.6 billion babies, non-therapeutic abortions, legal abortions. God knows how many illegal abortions, but 1.6 billion babies have been aborted. In the United States since 1973, since Roe v. Wade, over 60 million babies have been aborted. 60 million. Now, on the uh, abortion uh, map, this year alone, 14 million babies have been aborted. This year alone. And during this pandemic, during this pandemic, has, has, has abortion stopped? No. We know in the United Kingdom that they're giving pills to women at home so they can abort up to 10 weeks. So just today alone, up to 55,000 babies have been aborted. All these things are happening happening all together. They are amalgamating all together. And it says in Daniel, and this is the reason why I asked Brother Jacob to share today, because we do not serve a God that assumes, like I said earlier on, we serve a God that knows the end from the beginning. And he gives us insight through the illumination of the Holy Spirit by studying his word in prayer, in fasting, and seeking the face of God. And during this pandemic, Christians, though we can't meet in a building, just like many persecuted people throughout the world, they can't meet in buildings, but they're meeting underground churches or in homes. God, and we thank God for the technology that we can meet this, this way, but God is speaking to every Christian and examining our hearts and telling us and making us ready for the return of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, the reason, uh, the topic that I've asked Brother Jacob, and I thank Brother Jacob for today, for taking time out, is about the ten toes, the iron mixed with the clay. We know the gold, gold represented Babylon, silver represented Media Persia, the bronze represented Greece, the iron and the two legs represent Rome. Then you have the foundation, the feet, which is an amalgamation of iron mixed with clay. And the Bible speaks in the time of these kings, so the God of heaven establishes kingdom that will last forever. And it says that in Daniel chapter... Two, verse 44 it says in the in the days of these kings these 10 kings the god of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed and that kingdom will not be left for another people it will crush and put to an end all these kingdoms but it will itself endure forever Jesus says, when you see these things happening, look up for your redemption draws nigh. Jesus says, when we see these things happening, we are to seek the kingdom of God. We are called to preach the kingdom of God. Henceforth, the reason why we have Brother Jacob from Morial today. So, Jacob, I'm just going to hand it over to you. Uh, VOTV and the Fellowship of Servants welcome you and greet you. Now, at the end, brothers and sisters, we will be taking an offering. Palmer has sent the bank details, so if you can transfer whatever God has put on your heart to transfer, and we will be sending that to Moriel in our support for Jacob Prash's work that God is doing through him. So Jacob, over to you. Thank you very much, brother. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, in these last days, we see prophecy being fulfilled. There are so many things, much of it confusion, much of it speculation conspiracy theories, and varying interpretations of your word. We know, Lord God, that you have the truth, your son is the truth, and your spirit will lead us into all truth. Lead us into it now, Father, in the name of Jesus, amen. amen. <laughs> when I speak of a subject like this, it's good to preface it because people have been conditioned by popular trends to think in a certain way. <clears throat> oh, Jacob is going to tell us, or somebody's going to tell us what the ten horns are, or what the seven horns are, or things like this. Let's understand this. We are told in Daniel chapter 12, these things are to be sealed up until the appointed time. 
we see the breaking of the seals in the book of Daniel with the release of the horsemen of the apocalypse and so forth uh, taking place in Revelation chapter 6 and 7. From the 7th comes the trumpet judgments. Between the 6th and 7th, of course, is the rapture and resurrection. So we have a sealing and we have an unsealing. But it is a progressive revelation of what's already in Scripture. There's no new revelation. When I see people concocting these conspiracy theories, I become bewildered. Anything God is going to show us concerning the return of Jesus or the advent of Antichrist or the resurrection or anything of that nature <clears throat> related to the rapture or otherwise is going to have to be scripturally grounded. Amen. People become deviated into conspiracy theories about the Illuminati and all these kinds of things. Now, it's fine to be aware of those things. It's fine to be aware of what some people are calling a pandemic. We see how this pandemic is being manipul uh, politically manipulated and used by various powers that be for, for an agenda that's obviously their own. But we need to be focused on scripture. We should not look at scripture from the perspective of the circumstances. We should look at the circumstances from the perspective of scripture, as we've been saying for some time. Amen. Like Habakkuk, take our stand on the watchtower. We don't begin with the pandemic and try to understand what's going on, or Brexit and try to understand what's going on. We begin with the scripture and try to understand these other things. We have to have our boots <coughs> on the right foot. Now, concerning this unsealing, let's understand something. When the first seal is broken, the Antichrist is released. Okay. When the first seal is broken, okay, look with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 6. And I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder. A well, voice of thunder usually represents the voice of God, as in some said it thundered. Come! And I looked, and behold, the white horse. And he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. This has some kind of resemblance to Zechariah chapter 6, verse 2, obviously. So the first horse is this white one, the second is a red horse that is associated with war. The third horse is a black horse with famine, and a fourth horse, that is the fourth seal, combines all of them. The famine, the pestilence, the wars all come at once. Then comes martyrs, the fifth seal. Okay. Then the sixth seal is the terror, cosmic phenomena in which the rapture and resurrection take place during the interlude before the final seal is broken and the trumpet judgments are released, which, which commences the day of the Lord. <clears throat> that is the day of his wrath. Notice, seal these things up until the appropriate time. The faithful Christians will know who the Antichrist is. They will know. They will understand Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 11. The faithful believers are to know. But they will not know until the appropriate time. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us, clearly and directly, that the Episunagage are gathering together to be with Christ. That is the resurrection the anesthesia, and the rapture of the hot peso happening together at the revelation of the Lord, the parousia. This is called the episunagage, our gathering around him. It will not happen until the anthropon enomon, the man of lawlessness, is revealed. That's the first seal. 
That's what's broken. That's when we understand. Daniel writes a lot about the Antichrist, but he's told, seal these things up to the appropriate time. Not until the appropriate time will these seals be broken. Now, I'm not saying we're not getting a clearer and clearer picture <coughs> of the unfolding constellation of prophetic events in light of Scripture. We certainly are. Every day, things get a little bit clearer. Sometimes major events happen that really magnify Scripture. We're seeing clearer, but the seals are not yet broken. Mm. Not until they are broken can we be definitive. It's important that we understand this. When you see people telling you they've got it all figured out, that means they don't. The seal must be broken, and when the seal is broken, the faithful believers will know who Antichrist is. Now, this in itself is complicated because there are many Antichrists and many false prophets, many. <coughs> this is the ultimate two. Now, let's look at these ultimate two, the ultimate Antichrist, the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth. We call them the Antichrist. In fact, they're both Antichrist. Two beasts, one from the sea, one from the earth. They're not actually called Antichrist as such. But they're part of the diabolical counterfeit of the Trinity, Satan, the Antichrist, and false prophet. The false prophet is a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. Satan is a counterfeit of the Father. And obviously, the beast from the sea, the one we call Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, is a counterfeit of Jesus. Okay. Until you know who he is. Now remember, not until Jesus revealed the son of perdition mm -hmm. did they know. Only two people have a son of perdition. I refer you to my book, Shadows of the Beast, Judas and the Antichrist. As we've said a thousand times, whenever you see something about Judas Iscariot, the Holy Spirit is trying to show us something about the Antichrist. The son of perdition, the son of perdition. Both into money, okay? Both well disguised. John describes Antichrist and the character of Judas that went out from among us, but they were not really of us, like Judas at the Last Supper, okay? They're both not demon-possessed. Many are demon-possessed, but they're both Satan-possessed. Only two people satanically possessed. Okay. And they're both called the son with a definite article of perdition. Now, more can be said about this. They will both pretend to care for the poor, the way to <clears throat> manipulate people into thinking that they're nice humanitarian people by, by playing this social justice card. That's why I warn about social gospels and about uh, cultural Marxism getting into the church and so-called wokeness, getting into the church. This is all the setup. Having said that, let's look. Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? The apostles had no idea who it was until Jesus revealed him. Mm -hmm. The Antichrist is going to be very, very good at holding his cards close to his chest. Only Jesus knows who he is, and until Jesus reveals him, we're not going to know. Partly because there are many Antichrists. But this one is not even going to initially look like an Antichrist. He's going to look like one of us in some way. Now he comes counterfeiting Jesus. Jesus comes on a white horse in Revelation 19. <clears throat> Antichrist comes on a white horse in Revelation 6. He comes posing to counterfeit the millennial reign of Christ. He's going to bring peace. Remember, the stage is being set for this as we speak with things like Rick Warren's global peace plan. We have to unite with Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, Mormons to bring in global peace, teaches Rick Warren. 
and he's considered to be a believer. No, he's a false prophet preparing their way for Antichrist. That's what he is. And people like Todd Friel defend him. If possible, the elect will be deceived. It's happening. Antichrist will unite the world's false religions and bring about a counterfeit peace without Christ. Not until Jesus returns and establishes his millennial kingdom where there'll be a true, just, and lasting peace. But there'll be a counterfeit. That's what we see the stage being set for now. Now, when he came, nobody knew until Jesus said, that's him. And the breaking of bread, he was revealed. Mm -hmm. Masked by the opening of God's word and so forth, it's going to happen. Well, I point you again to the book, Shadows of the Beast. But let's look at the first coming of Jesus. We had various Antichrist figures typifying the Antichrist. One was Caesar Augustus, a deified emperor who assigned everybody in the empire a number, the Roman Empire, in order to maintain economic and financial control. Again, this is in Shadows of the Beast, and it's on our teaching about the nativity. He's a type of the Antichrist. So too we had Herod the Great, wanted to be king of the Jews. These are major pictures of the Antichrist. Okay, major pictures. <clears throat> now, let's look at this. There were people who understood but even people with the most understanding, like John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, had to send his disciples and say, Jesus, are you the one? Mm -hmm. Even the people who saw the clearest, who knew the most, the most spiritual people, the most enlightened, even John the Baptist, who operated in the spirit of Elijah, was filled with the spirit from his mother's womb was a biological relative of Jesus through their mothers. He's the harbinger of the Messiah. And even he did not fully get it until the appropriate time. The proper food at the proper time. Good and faithful servants give the proper food at the proper time. It says in Daniel chapter 11, those who have insight among the people will give insight to the many. There will be those who have insight, who will understand at the proper time and then tell others. Mm -hmm. But not until that happens can we be definitive. We can only be speculative. Mm -hmm. And we have to be very careful about being speculative. We cannot jump to conclusions. We cannot make definitive statements. That includes about the 10 toes. There are obviously certain things we can and do know about the 10 toes, but we must be very careful of saying this is that. It has to do obviously with the Antichrist kingdom in some way from Daniel and from Revelation. However, to say this is it, this is it. Now I've been saying for many years, and many people correctly have been saying for many years that the European Union is the embryo of what Daniel saw. I'm happy to say it's the embryo, but to say this is it is something very different. Something very different. We must be careful, not until the seal is broken. When the time came, the Magi knew. When the time came, the shepherds knew. When the time came, Mary and Joseph knew. When the time came, Elizabeth and Zacharias knew. When the time came, Simeon knew. When the time came, Anna knew. When the time came, John the Baptist knew. 
the faithful people of God will know when the time comes. The information is not for everybody. It's not for the world, and it's not for the apostate church. It's not for the false religious systems of the world. It's not for everybody. And it's a need to know basis. But not only a need to know basis, it is a when to know basis. We are only shown when we need to know. It's the proper food at the proper time. Mm -hmm. Now we can take many things into account. We can associate the 10 toes with the two legs of the fourth empire of Daniel chapter two. And we can talk about the Western European Union we can talk about those countries that are both members of the EU and of NATO, the powerful countries in Europe. We can exclude countries that were never part or never fully part of the Roman Empire. Even England, Cornwall was never Roman. Wales, the Romans invaded it, but they resisted. Scotland was never Roman. Ireland, the Romans called Hibernia, was never Roman. The Celtic world was never Roman. The Anglo-Saxons, English people of Anglo-Saxon descent, were Germans born here by the Romans. The indigenous peoples of the British Isles were Celts and some Viking invaders. But the Scandinavian countries where the Vikings came from they were not part of the Roman Empire. William the Conqueror, who was a French-speaking Viking, came centuries and centuries later. Britain was colonized by Rome. The initial Britons, the indigenous people, led by Boadicea, a woman, resisted them. This went on for some time. The Welsh fought them. <clears throat> um, the Scottish, the Picts and Scots fought them. Hadrian built the wall. Cornwall, you still have a high Celtic population in Cornwall. They were never, ever Roman. The people in Britain who are descendant from the Roman Empire are the Anglo-Saxons not the Anglo-Celts, or not the Nordic Celts. <clears throat> Britain was never fully in it. Very little of Holland, geographically, very little <clears throat> of Holland was ever in it. Denmark was never in it. The Slavic countries of Eastern Europe were never in it. They're in the EU, but they were never in the Roman Empire. The only country in Eastern Europe that was in the Roman Empire, and that remains a Latin country, is Romania. Very poor. The poorest country left after the Iron Curtain collapsed is probably Romania, or one of the poorest. That was part of the Roman Empire. Their language comes from Latin, much like Italian and Portuguese and so forth. So we can say Spain, Portugal, Italy, Belgium, France, Austria, Greece, Luxembourg, Germany. Switzerland was part of the Roman Empire, but it's not in the EU. <laughs> Romania is in the EU and it was part of the Roman Empire. We have to be very careful about being specific. Notice, Britain kept the pound. Denmark kept the krona. The Czech Republic kept its own currency. The ID card of a federal 
system, a federal state is a common currency. Not all the countries in the EU even subscribe to it. But the Roman Empire had a common currency. Caesar's head was on it, on the coins. Not all of them have it. Now, if you want to say, broadly speaking, we can see this, I agree. Broadly speaking, we can see this. But when you see people trying to be specific, we have a problem. We will not know until the appropriate time. The world and the apostate church will not know until it's too late. We need to pray that we'll be ready. We need to be studying God's word. We need to be alert, which as Tieth mentions is why Satan has raised up people like Rick Warren saying avoid end time prophecy, it's a diversion. Or why Satan is using John MacArthur. It'll be possible to take the mark of the beast, sell your soul to Satan, worship the Antichrist, and still be saved and go to heaven. Yeah. Revelation 24, Revelation 14, 11 says that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. They're trying to deceive the elect. They're being set up for it. Well, let's look and understand this better now. We will know. We can speculate, but we cannot be dogmatic. One of the most interesting, and I would say <clears throat> doctrinally and theologically important passages of Scripture is the road to Emmaus, mm. following the resurrection. When Jesus meets these disciples after his resurrection, they're very distraught and confused, and he sits down with them and he explains the Scripture. Now we get it. Now we get it. <laughs> Praise God. It's going to be the same. Now we get it. Of course. Why couldn't we see it? Because the proper food is served at the proper time. Mm -hmm. Now, with Clopas and then the Pericope, the account of the road to Emmaus, we notice some features. Jesus intended the past to keep going, remember? He intended that they had to invite him in. <laughs> they had to be desperate. People who are not desperate to know the truth, he's not going to waste his time with them. They had to invite him in. <clears throat> remember the last church, Laodicea, I sent him to the door and knock. He's not going to kick the door in. Secondly, he rebuked them, not angrily, but firmly, for not understanding the scriptures better than they did. No, they could not have known everything in the road to Emmaus, but they could have known more than they did. Well, today it's the same. We can know more than we do now. Many Christians don't know. You know, it's amazing. The blindness can be incredible. People don't see what's wrong with Rick Warren saying to unite with Hindus, Muslims, and Buddhists to bring in global peace. That's the Antichrist. He's going to unite the world's false religions, but there's Christians who don't see it. It's not that those people are going to be deceived by the Antichrist. They are deceived already by the spirit of Antichrist. Mm. We are speaking of the faithful. Mm. The faithful. That's what we are speaking of. Now, I can talk about this. I can talk about that. I can put out all the theories and all the views. You can go online and read all the theories and views for yourself. 
Let's try to understand what's happening now in light of Scripture. I didn't say let's try to understand the Scripture in light of what's happening now. I'm not saying let's try to understand the Scripture in light of the coronavirus pandemic. I'm saying let's try to understand the coronavirus pandemic in light of the Scripture relative to this passage. Turn with me, if you will, please, to Daniel chapter 2. The great statue of Rome, obviously. Verse 40. Then there'll be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things. Though like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all those in pieces. In that you saw the feet and toes, partially of potter's clay, partially of iron. It will be a divided kingdom, but it will have in it toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron was mixed with common clay. Or, as it can be translated, clay of mud. And as the toes of the feet were partially of iron, partially of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong, part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay. They will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. Let's understand this. Different people have proposed different interpretations. The two legs generally seen as the Latin West and Gr Greek East of the Roman Empire, which became the Holy Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire in the Middle Ages, and in some way have a reconfederation with five and five. This five and five, however, is interpreted different ways. Let's just look. We can't look at the entire panorama. Let's just look at some of it. If you've ever studied European history, it's the ultra montane. The ultra montane, looking over the mountains, the Alps, dividing northern Europe from southern. Okay, the north from the south. Okay. Most of the wealthier and more powerful countries in Europe, Germany, France, if you want to include Britain, the more dynamic economies, such as Holland, Scandinavian countries, but certainly the big ones, Germany, France, and some smaller ones, Belgium, Luxembourg, the Benelux countries. Netherlands, but Germany and France, the big ones, the two powerhouses of the continent, economically, politically, two powerhouses of continental Europe. They're the northern side. The poorer, although industrial developed, industrially developed, they're not like Germany, or like Holland, or like Britain, Spain, Portugal, Italy is a partial exception. Northern Italy is developed, but the rest of Italy, southern Italy, is not as developed as northern Italy. Definitely not. I've been there enough times. Two different Italys. Greece. Even in the EU, they refer to some of these countries as, quote-unquote, pigs. Mm -hmm. Portugal, <laughs> Italy, Greece, they call them pigs. 
people in Northern Europe subsidize the EU to subsidize the pigs. That's what they say. They actually say that. They might not say it in the EU Parliament in Strasbourg or at the European Council in Brussels, but if you read the newspapers, they look upon them as pigs. And an acronym, <clears throat> Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain, these are the pigs. You got the northern and the southern. You got the northern and you've got the southern. Okay. Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece. And because it was part of the Roman Empire and because it's a Latin country with a Latin culture, I'm telling you, when you cross the Danube, when you go from uh, Bulgaria in, into Romania, which I've done a few times, as soon as you cross the Danube, you know you've left the Slavic world and you've entered the Latin world. Romania, it's the peoples, the complexion, everything, the language, it's more like Italy and Portugal and things like that. Well, you got these, and Romania's poor. You got these pigs, man, <laughs> the pigs. Well, Germany, France, Luxembourg, Holland, Belgium, there's five more. They're all wealthy countries. They're wealthy. The mountains, Switzerland is neutral, it divides them. <laughs> you know, or even Austria, Switzerland. Five and five, right? people can say that. Others have equated it to Daniel 11, the kings of the north and the kings of the south. The kings of the north obviously are more associated with the Antichrist initially. But we think of the Roman Empire as European. Historically and scripturally in the book of Daniel <clears throat> and Revelation, the Roman Empire was not seen as continental Europe. It was seen as the countries around the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean was the Lake of Rome. After the Romans conquered Carthage in North Africa, everything, all of North Africa, Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, Algeria, the kingdom of the Berbers, the Berber people, uh, this was Roman Empire. Egypt being the most powerful of the southern ones. Okay. Then you had the Levant, where Israel was. This all goes to the prophecies of, of Daniel with the four generals of Alexander the Great dividing his kingdom. Um, Pompey, I'm, so, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ptolemy and Seleucus being the most important. And it was all caught up in the history of uh, Pompey and Octavius and Mark Anthony and Cleopatra and all this. I'm not going to go there today. I'll point you to our our books. However, five and five, well, the people, there were people who would say that. People, kings of the north, kings of the south. Okay. Look at it this way. I was born in New York. The northeast, the United States, they call it New England. Even looks like England, except they drive on the opposite side of the road. If you were driving in Connecticut or the Connecticut Valley, you would think you were in Shropshire in England, except that they're driving on the opposite side of the road. It looks like England. They call it New England with a Puritan skin. Looks like England. <laughs> the Spanish, Florida, the whole Southwest, the Conquistadores, Coronado de Soto, California, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico. That was Spanish. Okay. Alaska was Russian. Well, Alaska was Russian. The Midwest, from New Orleans all the way up to the Great Lakes. 
and then east to Quebec and Canada was French. New Orleans, Baton Rouge, St. Louis, Louisville, named after Louis the Fourteenth. Detroit means the Straits in, in French. The whole Midwest, from the Gulf of Mexico <clears throat> up to the Great Lakes, that was French, Spanish, British. All of it. You have the indigenous American people. But the people who westernized America, they're not indigenous. They came from countries that were descendant from the Roman Empire. Mm. World War I, if the Americans didn't enter that war, who knows what would have happened. Mm. Probably depopulated Europe the way it was going. Britain stood alone against the Nazis and the Italian fascists. If America didn't enter the Second World War, if Pearl Harbor didn't happen, what would have happened? This continues. When Yugoslavia broke up in the ancient hostilities in Yugoslavia between the Muslims, the Catholics, and the Eastern Orthodox, the Serbs, the Croats, and the Bosnians, this has been going on for centuries. Tito held it together artificially. When he was gone and communism collapsed, they, they just turned on each other as they always did. Who stopped it? I don't like the fact that they went in there and did what they did. I didn't agree with bombing the Serbs and things like that, but who stopped it? Did the Europeans stop? It was a war on European soil of genocidal proportions. The kind of stuff that happened in Rwanda and Burundi was now happening in Europe. Did the Europeans do anything about it? Did the Germans or the French or the Italians? It was right across from Italy, swimming distance. Did they do anything about it? No. The Americans and the British. <laughs> you know, you know, well, it was all Canada, the States, you know, the United States is, is energy independent. And you've got countries that are capital rich and technologically rich like Germany, but they don't have any natural resources. You've got countries with natural resources like Saudi Arabia, but they don't have the technology base. The United States, Canada, they have both, they have both the minerals and the technology base and the capital base. It's, it's the iron, it's the iron. America's only a cultural and anthropological colony of Europe that colonized and subjected the indigenous American native people who were busy killing each other before the white man came, before the European came. The United States was, look at the languages, spoke Spanish, French, all the way down, down Brazil, they speak Portuguese, <laughs> you know, they speak English. Up until the beginning of the 20th century, many people in Alaska spoke Russian. That's um, the way it is. They still do in the Aleutian Islands. It's the United States. Well, iron and clay. Do you interpret it that way? Is it ultramontanism? Is it transatlanticism? Is it the Western European Union? Which is it? Is it the kings of the north, the kings of the south? We need to be aware of all of these views. We need to take these views into consideration. We need to understand the arguments for and against these different views. However, we cannot be dogmatic and say, this is it. What can we be dogmatic about when we look at this issue? Well, there are two things. Notice something. Germany, France, Italy, Spain, did they act in concert with each other? 
did the unelected socialist bureaucracy of Belgium deliver a coordinated, orchestrated plan to cope with the coronavirus and its economic and public health after effects? No. The proportion, America has more debts of anybody except probably China. They're probably still lying. We don't know about them. But in proportionate terms, Iran, well, Iran certainly, but in Europe, Italy and Spain have a higher proportion of death than the United States. It's quite high in Britain. Not as high as they made it out to be. Not as much as the ordinary flu, but it's there. Okay. Where was Brussels? Muttering in the corner. <laughs> Merkel's Germany acted unilaterally and decisively. France, France, France acted universally and decisively. Italy made its own agenda to cope with it, as did Spain. Why didn't the great European Union do anything post-Brexit? It did nothing because it is nothing. They tried to make the iron stick to the clay. They're desperate for the Antichrist. They're desperate for this satanically empowered man to create an artificial European unity and then extend it beyond that to the Middle East. But it's not working. Second, the kings of the North, the kings of the South. Turkey will never be the Turkey of Atatürk again. Turkey was supposed to be like Japan. Japan had the Shinto religion, but MacArthur wrote them a Western constitution and they were to be like any other parliamentary democracy in the world with their religion separate from their elections and government. That's Japan. Long before MacArthur imposed that on Japan at the end of the Second World War when Japan was defeated. Atatürk wanted that for Turkey. He said, we're going to keep our Turkish culture, our Muslim religion, but that's separate. Our government, our economy is going to be Western. Well, that's gone. Under Erdogan is becoming more and more fundamentalist, more and more Islamist. And he's playing a card. You've got Arab Muslim refugees from Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere. Arab Muslim refugees from North Africa and black African Muslim refugees swarming across the Mediterranean and coming via the Middle East and Turkey, invading Europe. <laughs> kings of the North, kings of the South. We got to stop this. Many of these people are corona infected. What is that? <laughs> are we going to control it? You can ask this question. But we can see the iron does not stick to the clay. Looking at the present situation, you can see what Daniel was talking about. They cannot make a cohesion. These countries are too different, too different historically, linguistically, culturally, politically. Many of them have traditional enemies. It just doesn't work. And they're desperate to find somebody to make it work. So Europe cannot compete with the United States unless it unites. And that's a common market. But now you have Brexit. 
Well, the Americans replaced NAFTA with the new MCA, Mexico, Canada, America, virtually gets the common market. The trade organization. Now, verse 43 of Daniel 2. You saw the iron mixed with common clay. They'll be combining with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere. The more they talk about multiculturalism, the less it works. <laughs> I have many Christian friends saved out of Hinduism and Sikhism. A lot of them are educated people. They emphasize education and business. Lawyers, physicians, engineers and computer people particularly, mathematicians, very good at this. They do a better job with it in the Indian diaspora, in, 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 in Singapore, and in the USA, and in Great Britain than they do in India. I mean, you've got a Silicon Valley in Bangalore, but India's economy is still only 20% the size of China's, despite being English-speaking, more democratic, and having the most scientists and engineers and mathematicians per capita of any country. It's only 20%. You take them out of India and you put them in England, look, within one, two generations, their kids are scientists or something like that. Now, of course, with the believers, it's, it's different. The believers tended to be more educated anyway, the ones from Kerala and so forth. But what about the other ones? What about people who are in the BJP? Mm -hmm. They're never going to integrate. They can't even integrate with the educated westernized Indians. Doesn't work. India will soon be the biggest Muslim country in the world. Mm -hmm. It will not only overtake China as the most populous country, it'll overtake Indonesia as the most Muslim country in terms of numbers of Muslims. 160 million? The numbers of Muslims are decreasing in Indonesia, although the Indonesia government tries to suppress it because so many Muslims are becoming Christian. There's a move of God in Indonesia. But people don't know, there's something called the India Liberation Front. You have organized radical Islam in India. Look what they did in the hotels and hospitals in Mumbai and the shooting the place. I don't know. You got these people in conflict with the Akali Dal and with the BJP and Mori and all this. It's, what a situation. You can't combine the seeds of men. It doesn't work. That's why you had Bangladesh and East Pakistan and Pakistan and India and Bhutan and places like that, and Sikkim and Bhutan and Nepal. You can't combine the seeds. Mm -hmm. You look at Britain. Okay, educated Indians acculturate quite easily because they're professional and business people. And they work with English people in the professions and in business. That's one thing. Educated Indians will acculturate. They may keep their own cuisine and things like that, but they'll acculturate. English will become the main language instead of Hindi and things like that. Many of them have never been to India. But look at fundamentalist Muslims. Look at Bradford, look at Birmingham. Look at Burton on Trent. I mean, these people don't assimilate. They don't. 
Now, there's always been religious minorities who didn't assimilate. In the United States, it's the Amish, the Pennsylvania Dutch, or the Hasidic Jews. They have a distinct culture based on their religious beliefs apart from the mainstream of society. But they don't want to fight with anybody. They just want to keep to themselves. Islam has an agenda. Fundamentalist Islam has an agenda. It divides the world into Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harb. They're trying to push Sharia into the British court system. The numbers of Muslims on the dole is unbelievable because they see it as demitude. The infidel paying the penalty for not being a Muslim. That's how they see social benefits of them. It doesn't work. They can talk about multiculturalism all they want. It will not work. Never going to happen. India, maybe Sikhs and Buddhists and Hindus can have an imperfect peace. That is, not be at war with each other, coexist functionally and practically. It is theoretically possible for Christians and Buddhists and moderate Hindus and Sikhs to coexist. That's possible. But when fundamentalist Hindus say that all people of India, because they're citizens, have to reverence cows, <laughs> they say that. And they go out with armed gangs, not the police, stopping vehicles, transporting cows. Are you taking these cows to be slaughtered? Oi, va voy. Certain states in India have meat, certain don't. I remember I was in Mumbai once, they had the sacred cows causing traffic jams, and I went into the Raj Hotel and ordered a hamburger. <laughs> don't, don't, don't ask me. <laughs> it's not going to combine. It's not going to... Now... Christians can combine across ethnic lines. Doesn't matter if you're Asian, Caucasian, African, Jew, Gentile, one in Christ, because it's based on second birth, not birth. <clears throat> but fundamentalists, it's never gonna happen. Mm. Muslims, fundamentalist Muslims, it's never gonna happen. The fundamentalist Muslims cannot even get along with the westernized Muslims. Who want, who want to live peaceably. Muslims who want to live peaceably with Christians and stuff, they're, they're oppressed increasingly by the radical ones. <clears throat> they're setting up their own police and vigilante groups and wanting Sharia in, in Britain, in, in Rotterdam, in the cities of Europe. Nope. Whatever these toes are, will not adhere to one another as iron does not combine with pottery. They will seek to do it in the seed of men, but they'll not adhere. It's just not going to happen. It will never happen. Never. Even a place like Northern Ireland, they're both Celts. The Catholics and Protestants are both mainly Celts. Anthropologically, they're the same. It's the religion that keeps them different and history. It's hard enough to get them to live together. <laughs> to stop killing each other. They're never going to do it. They will try to artificially construct a multicultural, multi-ethnic society through manipulation of the school system and the media and corrupt and stupid government policies, but it will never, ever, ever work. Whatever these toes are, 
They're going to fall off. <laughs> well, let's begin to understand some more things about the toes. Another way some people have approached it is what some people consider to be the prophetic Psalm 83 of the constellation of nations that will come against Israel. Some say it has never happened historically in that constellation. These nations have fought Israel, but now it is unified orchestration taking place that is fulfilling the prophecy. I'm not saying they're right. I'm not saying they're wrong. My personal view is they are partially right, but some people are taking it way too far. But that's not the issue. Let's look. Right at the moment, it's not. Let's look at Psalm 83. Oh God, do not remain quiet. Do not be silent, oh God. Do not be still. Behold, thine enemies make an uproar. Those who hate thee have exalted themselves. He makes good plans against thy people and conspire together against the treasured ones. They've said, come, let us wipe them out as a nation. Let the name of Israel be remembered no more. We're talking about Islamic nationalism. For they've conspired together with one mind. Against thee do they make a covenant. Remember, Ishmael seed will always be divided and Esau's sword will be against his brother. Unless Abraham's children, the Arabs, turn to Christ, they're always going to be divided against each other. Much the same as Israel will be under the curse of the law until they accept Yeshua, the Messiah. Mm -hmm. The only uniting factor is their hatred of the infidel, particularly of the Christian, particularly of Britain and America, and their hatred of Israel. Israel is not only an affront to them, it shows their religion does not work. Allah does not give them victory in the jihad against Israel. Israel reverses Dar al-Islam. They believe once Muslims have conquered a land, it's theirs by divine right irrespective of the fact that the Hebrews are the indigenous people. Well, let's look. They've conspired with one mind against thee. It's against the Lord. They make a covenant. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagarites, Gebal and Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre. Assyria also has joined with them. They've become a help to the children of Lot. Deal with them as with Midian and as with Sisera and Yabin. Now, there's 10 nations here, 10 Islamic nations. Some say that. I don't see these things as mutually exclusive. I don't think it's a coincidence that there's 10. But I don't think that's always going to be it, that, that that's the ultimate meaning. I think it helps illuminate the ultimate meaning. But we've seen these 10 nation conspiracies elsewhere. They're types, they're shadows. Let's understand something. Look with me, please, to Daniel chapter 7. Interpreting scripture in light of scripture. I kept looking in the night vision, and behold, the fourth beast dreadful and terrifying, extremely strong, this is Rome, and it had large iron teeth, 
it devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. There is obviously some kind of relationship between the 10 toes and 10 horns. And I was contemplating the horns. Now look what happens. Behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them. And three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. Now it's interesting to know that the early church saw two of these horns, or well, these horns is Ethiopia and Egypt and Libya. <laughs> and they were pulled out by the roots before it, and behold, the horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and the mouth uttering great things. And I kept looking until thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat. The Lord comes and he puts an end to it. Well, you've got these 10. There they are, the 10. But this little one comes up among it. The little horn is always the Antichrist. He doesn't seem like a likely candidate. He never does. Oh, was it the Pope? Well, the Pope is an Antichrist, or he's a false prophet and an Antichrist. But he's a big horn. Oh, it's the President of the United States. <laughs> it's going to be a little horn. He's going to be well disguised. He's not going to be a likely candidate. Something of these 10. Well, let's look a little further. Turn with me, please, to Revelation chapter 13. The Antichrist chapter. <coughs> And he stood on the sand of the seashore. The dragon was enraged with the woman. Okay. And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. Now those seven heads, obviously, are from Daniel chapter 7. And on his horns were ten diadems. Notice the ten again. And on his heads were blasphemous names. Suppose, and I'm not saying anything, we're not declaring, we're not even educated guessing. But notice each of the seven has 10 of its own. The diadems. So you're not just talking about one group of 10. You're talking about another category of 10. Diadem has to do with the crown, doesn't it? And the beast I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like those of a bear, its mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power, and his throne had great authority. In Daniel, these beasts follow each other in a succession corresponding to political imperial empires, which in turn have some kind of a correspondence more abstractly to the four sections of Nebuchadnezzar's statue. But here in Revelation, something happens. Although they are of consecutive origin, they become one freak entity. 
The dragon is there. The leopard had to do with Greece. The bear, the lion. It's something multinational. It's consecutive, yet it's ultimately going to be concurrent. The Antichrist is going to wield a lot of power. Again, I'd point you to our book, Shadows. Remember, Herod the Great is a major, major type of the Antichrist. Can't go into it, read the book. He was an Idumean. He was an ethnic Arab. His parents were Arabs. They were from Idumea, Edom, in Jordan. That's where their homeland was. And they came to Idumea and the northern Negev and converted to Judaism. He was ethnically an Arab, but by religion he was a Jew. The Idumeans converted to Judaism. Herod was a Jew for political reasons. But if you read the scriptures and you read the history of Josephus and so forth, he was a Roman. Culturally and politically, he was a Roman, and the Romans accepted him as one of them. A man who is European, Arab, and Jewish at the same time. Can unite everybody. Again, he's going to counterfeit Christ. Unite everybody. Well, he's going to do so, not only diabolically, but satanically. Well, let's look at Revelation 17. I'd like to begin, please, in verse 12. We'll give it an explanation. In fact, maybe we should rather begin in verse 10. And there are seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, the other not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. The early Christians speculatively associated this with Nero, who in fact was a partial fulfillment of it. They thought he was going to raise from the dead some of them by satanic power. When he comes, he must remain a little while. He's not going to be around a long time. And the beast which was and is not is himself an eighth and is one of the seven and it goes to destruction. Plainly the Antichrist. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings which have not yet received the kingdom but they receive authority as kings with the beast for an hour. The Antichrist will have a ten-nation confederation. Somehow, the ten toes will ultimately be his alliance. It would appear. Well, look at this. But when they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour... An hour is not a long time now. It doesn't mean, you know, 60 minutes. It's like when Jesus said, my hour has come. <laughs> it means a brief period that commences at this time. The hour has come. Okay. He's not going to wield all this power all at once for a long time. In fact, he won't get it all at once. These are wage war against the Lamb, 
and the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And those who are with him are called and chosen and faithful. This will be Satan's last stand to try to prevent the return of Christ. He will attempt to destroy the true church, nearly succeed but fail, divine intervention. He will try to destroy Israel and the Jews, nearly succeed but fail, divine intervention. And he will literally grab power and try to prevent the return of Christ. It is his hour. But Jesus says, no, it's my hour. My hour has come. Praise God. The hour of your destruction. Now these things all relate to and encompass the tendos. I've spoken broadly. I've spoken about things we can be scripturally sure of. <clears throat> I'm prepared to be fairly dogmatic, even to a degree rigidly dogmatic about those things that I've said. But I am not going to be specific yet. The time will come when we can be. By the grace of God, the good and faithful servant, I'm not saying that's an individual. <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm certainly not saying it's me. <laughs> we'll give the proper food at the proper time. But Daniel, those who have insight among the people, will give understanding to the many. When I know, you'll know. Daniel only wrote what he knew, what he saw, what he heard, what the angels told him. John, the same in Revelation. I can tell you what I know. And you can hold me to it. But I have to be very, very careful. I can say, thus thinketh Jacob. Be careful, Jacob is fallible, but Jacob thinks this could be. Qualified. But if Jacob was to say, Thus saith the Lord, this is it. <laughs> Jacob better be right. Let few of you be teachers. Teachers will be judged more strictly than the rest. Don't worry. For those who love the Lord, Proper food will be there at the proper time, but not before. In the meantime, though, we should be eating the food that's available, unless we digest the grain, the food the Lord has already given us and act on it, not just know it intellectually, but act on it, unless we eat and act on what he's already provided. Don't expect him to give us more. <laughs> well, I want him to give us more. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I and you have to eat and act upon what he's already given us. My name is Jacob Prash from Morial Ministries. I thank the fellowship in Wolverhampton and Tiff for having me. 
May the Lord bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>